to uh, Psalm 17. Psalm 17. Psalm 17, we'll read verse 3. Psalm 17, verse 3. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Father, we pray your blessing upon your word now. We thank you for these children. And uh, Father, we just pray that you'll Continue to bless these children, dear God, and, and uh, Father, have your perfect will in their lives. Continue to use them for your honor and glory. And Father, we pray that you'll bless this message now. Save that lost soul that might be in the building. Pray that you might strengthen and encourage your people. We pray, dear God, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We read here in Psalm 17, <coughs> verse 3. Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. I began a series of messages a while back uh, with verses that have the word nothing in them. The word nothing. And uh, this here, uh, the psalmist David says, uh, Thou hast tried me and shall find nothing there in the middle of the verse. And... Uh, <clears throat> Have you ever had someone mad at you or falsely accuse you of something in spite of the fact that you didn't do anything wrong at all? Uh, I'm sure probably everybody has been accused. This is where David is uh, at this time of his life when he writes uh, this Psalm 17, verse 3. And uh, David was confident in his innocence uh, toward Saul, King Saul. David made it clear that he didn't do anything, nothing, uh, against Saul. And uh, he prayed to the Lord. He said, you've proved my heart. And, uh, and then he says, you've proved my heart. And then he says, thou hast visited me in the night. And uh, I, think, I believe we went over that. Uh, we find the Lord inspecting David like an audit auditor that checks the books on a, or a general who inspects his troops uh, looking for flaws or mistakes. And... Uh, David was not claiming to be perfect or sinless in the whole entirety of his life, but he was aware of the fact that he hadn't done anything wrong to Saul, uh, the king there. And uh, so he says, you've tried me, you've proved me, uh, so forth and so on. And uh, the pure heart of David motivated him to do what was right. A person, uh, Brother Aaron mentioned this in Sunday school, but... Uh, a person who has a clear conscience is motivated to maintain that condition and not mess it up. And this is what Paul was talking about. I believe he uh, mentioned this in Sunday school, this verse in, uh, uh, over there in Acts 24, 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. In David's situation, he made up his mind and purpose that he would not sin with his tongue here in Psalm 17, 3. And Solomon also expressed the same attitude in Proverbs 8, verse 8. He wanted nothing that was corrupt, perverted, crooked, or deceptive to come from his lips. Proverbs 8, 8, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing, there's that word nothing, forward or perverse in them. James talks about this in James 3, 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. David's desire came from the heart of a man who wanted to do what was right, uh, according to the word of God. He said, I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. David reasoned within himself, and he said, I'm not going to sin with my tongue and talk badly about King Saul. You're going to keep, uh, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Spurgeon said, the great preacher of the 1800s, he said, hands and feet one may bind, but who can fetter the lips? Iron bands may hold a madman, but what chains can restrain the tongue? He said, it needs more than a purpose to keep this nimble offender 
within its proper range. I want to thank the Lord for the Holy Spirit of God who can give us the power to restrain us from saying things from uh, things that we shouldn't say. Well, I've said some things through the years that I shouldn't have said. While I was saying them, I wanted to grab the words that came out of my mouth Amen. and try to put them back in my mouth. And I thought, shut your mouth. Amen. Amen. Uh, David determined he would not speak evil to king. That's the battle that each one of us face, the battles with our tongue. That's the greatest battle of the Christian, uh, one of the greatest battles of the Christian life. Uh, there's a true story I read about uh, tr uh, years ago uh, about a train filled with weary, exhausted people, a train. Most of the day had been spent on a journey through the hot, parched plains in the state of Kansas. Now at last, the curtain of the day had been drawn and the coolness of the evening was embraced by the passengers for a time of needed slumber. <coughs> Excuse me. Like the beating of a heart, the mesmerizing rhythmic sounds of the wheels of the train as they rolled over the tracks soothed the passengers and began to serenade them to slumber, to sleep. The serenade, however, was interrupted because at one end of the rail car was a man who was holding a tiny baby that was fussy, restless, and started crying. No matter what he tried to do to calm the infant, it failed. Nothing was working. Nothing would keep the baby from crying. And the more the father tried, the louder the baby screamed with a piercing cry. Unable to take it any longer, a big, brawny man spoke for the rest of the group and said, why don't you go ahead and just take the baby to its mother? There was a moment of pause, and then came the reply from the exhausted father. He said, I am terribly sorry. He said, I'm doing my best. I'm unable to take my daughter to her mother because she is resting in her casket in the baggage car ahead of us. We are traveling home to bury her. Again, there was a dreadful tense silence on the train. All that could be heard was the clatter of the tracks as the train rolled forward into the horizon. Then with tears in his eyes, the impatient man who asked the cruel question approached the father. He pulled his foot out of his mouth, you might say, and he asked the father to forgive him for his impatience and rudeness. Yeah. He then proceeded to take that little baby girl into his own massive arms, cradling the baby with a warm embrace. He kindly told the weary, exhausted father to get some rest. And for the rest of the night, with loving patience, the man cared for that motherless baby girl and loved her as if she was his own. May we learn to think before we speak and find out what's going on before we suffer from foot and mouth disease and make a fool out of ourselves. Yeah. There's been times through the years that uh, I have said things that I shouldn't say. I'm sure we can all say that. But there's been times that I got ready to say something to an individual, but I, it's like the Holy Spirit said, no, don't say nothing. And then I found out what was going on. I found out the true story. I found out what the person was going through or I found out why the person was doing what they were doing or whatever the situation was. And it's like I'm thinking, it's like the Holy Spirit said, see, that's why I told you not to say anything. Yeah. Psalms 141 verse 3, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, keep the door of my lips. So we've examined two areas about the nothings of a clear conscience. The nothing of a clear conscience result in proper behavior. The nothings of a clear conscience are rooted in a pure heart and lead to a purpose to guard our tongue. And next, I want to look at the nothings of a clear conscience resolved to be persistent in maintaining a, a right relationship with God and man. I believe Brother Aaron mentioned this verse also, Acts 24, 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Those who desire a clear conscience want to be consistent in maintaining a great relationship with God and men. 
They want nothing to hinder or cloud their closeness with the Lord and others or rob them of peace and spiritual power. See, when you have a conscience void of offense toward God and man, when you've got a clear conscience, you've got a spring in your step, you've got a smile on your face, you've got the joy of God in your heart, yeah. the peace of God that passes all understanding. But when your conscience is bothering you, it's kind of like a little, a little dog nipping at your pants leg all the time. Their concern is to be the best Christian they can be for Christ so they will be an effective ambassador for Jesus and a true blessing to other people. What will help you immensely in maintaining a clear conscience is learning to get along with God. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but probably not a lot of Christians in America get along with God. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to be alone. And I know there's times elderly people might not... They might not uh, they shouldn't be alone in a situation, circumstances. But I'm talking about as a general rule, all right? Not every single Christian in America is, you know, 90, 90 or 100 years old, all right? So, but a lot, a lot of Christians don't want to be uh, alone and uh, spend time with him daily. For some folks, being alone or isolated is misery, but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. You'd be surprised what God will do in your heart when you get alone with God. Yeah. And God will show you things. You say, that's why that's why a lot of people don't want to be alone. That's why they got a television blaring 24 hours a day. Amen. That's why they got uh, something on a radio or a CD or their phone or something on playing something 24 7. They don't ever, they want to drown out the Spirit of God working in their hearts and moving in their hearts. But that's the thing that we need today in America. Yeah. Especially through what this country's been through in the last year and a half. You need God to speak to your heart. I read this. Did you know that George Frederick Handel, Handel stayed in his home for 24 days in 1741? When he emerged from isolation, Handel, 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 held in his hands the masterpiece known as Handel's Messiah. He was alone for 24 days. You said it's back in 1741, preacher. They didn't have nothing back then. That's, that's what people did. They spent time alone. That's what we ought to do today sometimes. Amen. Yeah. The 259 page symphony orchestration celebrates the coming of Jesus Christ, his passion, and the glorious resurrection of our wonderful Savior. On the last day of his isolation, Handel wrote three letters on the final page of his composition. They were the letters S D G which stood for Soli, S-O-L-I, D-O, D-E-O, Gloria, which means to God alone be the glory. Amen. Amen. It's amazing what can happen in us and through us when we spend time alone with God. May we use those times of isolation in our lives to, to spend time with the Lord and be still. I don't know how many people I've talked to through the years who said they, they were in a hospital or they were in a jail cell or something, but God put them on their back or God put them in isolation somewhere, and that's when they either got saved or they were already saved but backslid and they got their heart right with God. Because God's got to get you away from all the noise and the distraction. And a lot of times he's got to get you away from all the people and family, and friends, and relatives, and neighbors, and work associates, and the dogs, and the cats, and the parakeet, and everybody else. May we listen to what he has to say through his word and his spirit. Think about this. The words silent and listen. Silent, S-I-L-E-N-T. Listen, L-I-S-T-E-N-E-N. The words silent and listen have the same letters differently arranged. Silent and listen. They remind us that the best way to listen is to be silent. Yeah. Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Yeah. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The nothings of a clear conscience reveal <laughs> your purity to others 
who oppose you. Acts 4, 19 to 21 says, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Acts 4, 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing. Boy, could that, wouldn't that be wonderful if that would be true of all of us? They couldn't find nothing on us. Finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. In a list of the year 2020, New York's work-related resolutions, just 8% of the people aspired for a raise. 8% said, I want a raise. This was last year. While 41% said that what they wanted most was to make a difference. Folks, I'll tell you how you can make a difference. Get saved if you're not saved and serve God if you are saved. Amen. Amen. That's how you can make a difference in yeah. other people's lives. Amen. God created us to have a purpose. That's why we long for it and need it. When we look at the disciples, we find that they were men who had a purpose to glorify Christ. Their purpose helped them to make a difference. It'll do that for you and I. Uh, John Stott wrote a timeless truth about evangelism in 1962. He stated, Nothing shuts the mouth, seals the lips, and ties the tongue like the secret poverty of our own spiritual experience. You say, what are you saying? The Christians in the early church, they had to commanded to be they, they were commanded to be quiet by their opposers. They told them to shut up. Don't speak in the name of Jesus. While today, believers have to be motivated to speak up about the Lord. These men could not help but tell what they had seen and what they had heard about Jesus. They couldn't help it there in Acts 4, verse 19 to 21. Our silence either indicates we are not yet redeemed, haven't been saved, or we've suppressed Christ's life-giving presence in us to such an extent that we have nothing fresh to tell about him. Folks, do you realize if you're saved, you have the greatest message in the world? Yeah. Yeah. You have, hey, this world, I know they talk about the weather, they talk about sports, they talk about COVID, <clears throat> they talk about everything that's going on in America, around the world, and politics, and everything else. You know what the most important message in the world is? Is to tell other human beings about a wonderful Savior and how they can get saved. Amen. And how they can live for God and have an abundant life after they get saved. Yep. After the disciples endured threats and intimidation, those who opposed them let them go because they found nothing how they might punish them. Amen. Acts 4, 20 and 21. Nothing. The clear conscience and godly lives of the disciples revealed to their accusers they were guilty of doing nothing wrong. Because of bitterness, wickedness, or hatefulness, some will ignore your purity and persecute you anyways, even though you've done nothing wrong. That's what happened to Jesus Christ, obviously. Luke 23, 15. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Luke 23, 41, and we indeed justly, one of the uh, thieves said, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man, referring to Jesus Christ, hath done nothing amiss. Yeah. Think about a man who never sinned. Just being around him will get you under conviction. Yeah. An army chaplain in World War II finally made it back to America on the first Christmas Eve after the war was over. <clears throat> He'd been overseas for nearly two years and hadn't seen his family in all that long time. He called his wife and told her that he was home and if everything worked out, he'd be in sometime later that night. That meant that he would be home in time for Christmas. Mother, the mother was thrilled. The two of them decided, though, not to tell the children just in case something happened. 
They also wanted his arrival to be a surprise on Christmas morning. The next morning, Christmas morning, when the children were all gathered around to open their presents, the white sheet on which the presents had been placed suddenly stirred. From among the packages arose the children's father. Like a Christmas present that comes to life, the children went crazy with excitement. You can imagine the joy which that family experienced that Christmas. The children had only expected presents, but they found their father instead. Their father gave himself to them for Christmas, and that's the meaning of the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. Amen. In the same manner, we're to give ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us. Who loved me, Paul said, and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20, Christ. Folks, we ought to give ourselves to him. Yeah. Yeah. We ought to follow the example of the Christians in Macedonia, 2 Corinthians 8.5, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. There's the nothings from thoroughness. Thoroughness. Some of you have businesses here this morning in the congregation. And maybe you, some of you are teachers or whatever you might be. And one of the things that you like is for a person to be thorough. I want to tell you something. We serve a thorough God. Yeah. Yeah. You say, what do you mean by thorough? I'll, I'll explain. Uh, Oscar Hammerstein had seen a picture, a photograph of the top of the Statue of Liberty from a helicopter. He said, this picture reveals the intricate detail that has been sculpted on Lady Liberty's head. Her hair, her crown, and all those things at that angle, which no one could ever see. Up in a helicopter, he could look down. Hammerstein continued, he said, I got to thinking about the sculptor must have realized that never will anyone see the top of the Statue of Liberty's head since there were no airplanes or helicopters when the statue was set in place. He spent the same kind of detail, care, and painstaking craftsmanship, the person that did Lady Liberty, on the top of Lady Liberty's head, as he did down at the feet and everywhere else that would be seen by everybody. The sculptor was very thorough in his work. Little did the sculptor know that someone would be able to see the statue from above someday. That, however, is the way thorough people think. Thorough. Thorough people are diligent in completing an entire task. Those unseen details are important to them. Are you thorough in what you do? You say, what do you mean? What's it actually mean to be thorough? Thoroughness gives attention to details. It's a desire to serve by considering all factors and working hard to achieve a good finished project. The thorough person pays careful attention from beginning to the end of a process or a project. Thoroughness doesn't mean you're perfect or your work is perfect. Nobody is perfect and no work is perfect except God. And his work. Thoroughness involves hard work, dedication, thoughtfulness, consideration, creativity, and an attitude of service. The thorough person might have to work a little harder or longer to take care of minute details, but the end product of his labor tends to be of greater quality and beauty and effectiveness. This is why people rely on thorough people. If you have a business, you want a person that's thorough. Amen? Yeah, you want a person that just don't say, oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's half done. Yeah, that, that's why it's, it's all right. Give that back to the customer. It's half. It's, it's, was it done right? Is it done? I don't know. It might be, might not be. Just get back to them. If it isn't, they'll bring it back in. This is why people rely on thorough people. They know the task will be done right. When you are thorough, you're willing to put in extra effort to ensure things are done completely and correctly. 
That's the way God is. The Lord is thorough in what He does. He completes what He starts. What He forgives, I thank God He forgives completely. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? I mean, I could preach five hours on the thoroughness of God. I mean, He's thorough in His Bible, His Word of God, the way He does things, His ways, His wills, His work, everything. I mean, He's a thorough God. The nothings concerning thoroughness and following directions. Exodus 12.10 says, And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. God was preparing his people for their deliverance, Exodus 12, and their departure from Egypt. Instructions were given to prepare a lamb for the night of their freedom from bondage. And God goes into minute details. Just like he did about the ark with Noah. Just like he did with the tabernacle there in Chronicles and in the Old Testament books. I mean, it goes into minute detail. Matter of fact, when you read some of that stuff, you're thinking, God, do you have to go through all that? Yes, he does. He's a thorough God. Yeah. The lamb was to be sacrificed at twilight, and the blood was to be spread on the doorpost and lintels of their homes in order to be spared of the death of the firstborn in that household that night. They were to be ready to travel at a moment's notice. The lamb was to be roasted and eaten in haste, and nothing was to be left over until morning. Anything that remained was to be burned, Exodus 12. Without refrigeration, the meat would be contaminated by bacteria. Like the Hebrews, the Jews, we too are to be ready to go at a moment's notice. You've got to be ready to leave this work through death or through rapture. We are to be prepared for death if it should come our way. Or we're to be ready to be taken out of this world by the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture of the church. Paul talked about 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 to 18. A scoffing infidel of considerable talents was once in the company of a Christian of slender intellect. The infidel believed that he could easily outsmart this believer with his ungodly wit. He put the following question to him. He said, I understand, sir, you expect to go to heaven when you die. Can you tell me what sort of place heaven is? Yes, sir, replied the Christian. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people, and if your soul is not prepared for it, with all your boasted wisdom, you'll never enter there. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? You've got to follow God's directions if you want to go to heaven. Amen. But people try to climb up some other way. And Jesus said the same as a thief and a robber in John chapter 10. Amen? Amen. And so the nothings concerning thoroughness in obedience. In Joshua eleven fifteen, 15, it says, As the Lord commanded Moses, his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Joshua followed the commands that were given to Moses for battle. They even followed the battle tactics that God gave to them. The enemies of Israel were severely defeated because Joshua and the Hebrews obeyed. Nothing was undone or left out. They complied implicitly. God expects the same kind of obedience from us. Nothing is to be left out. We're to obey what he commands our obedience demonstrates the love that we have for him. See, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is this. People don't understand that God loves you more than you love yourself. Amen. That's a lot of love for some people because they really love themselves. <laughs> yeah. But God knows what's best for you and I. And God will lead and guide and direct you and we got to obey him, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Yeah. A preacher, a true story, uh, from the West, uh, preached at a missions conference to a Chinese Christian group about the call to missions. When the group prayed, he said, I sense God is calling someone from this group to become a missionary. No one responded to his words, so they continued to pray. Again, he asked, if someone sensed that God was calling him or her to missions, no one said anything. They prayed again. But this time when he asked, one woman responded, 
that she sensed that God was calling her to the country, the, uh, the country of Myanmar, M-Y-A-N-M-A-R, Myanmar, an Asian country. The group laid their hands on her and prayed for her until the class ended after midnight. The next morning, he scanned the room and noticed the woman who expressed a call to missions was absent. And he asked the others where she was. Someone said, oh, she left this morning. Left? Where? The teacher asked. Well, the man said, she was called to missions last night, so she lined up a partner and they left on the bus at 4 a.m. this morning. They have gone to Myanmar. Now, I'm not saying God does that with everybody. You know, God calls you, you know, one night and next morning you leave the mission field. But, I mean, God blesses obedience because it's important to him. God wants us to be obedient. Yeah. Obey the Lord. Uh, there's a cry of fire near a large schoolhouse. The children in the school were very much affrighted and began to rush to the doors and stairs, of course, periling their lives and limbs. There was, however, one little girl who remained quietly in her seat. Her teacher asked her why she did not do as the other girls did. She said, my father is a fireman. And he told me whenever there was a cry of fire while I was in school to remain quiet in my seat, for that was the safest way. I was dreadfully frightened, but I knew that father had told me what was best. So I sat still when they ran to the doors. Father knows best. Our Heavenly Father knows yeah. best. Amen. Amen. May we learn to obey the Lord thoroughly like this little girl who obeyed her father. The nothings from thoroughness in declaring God's message openly. I'll close with this. 1 Samuel 3.18 And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. God had called out to little Samuel in the night. The lad thought it was Eli calling. After this happened several times, Eli realized it was the Lord calling the lad, and he instructed Samuel what to do. When God called again in a vision. Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Thy servant heareth. Amen. We're to declare God's message to this world about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When you talk to people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Paul said it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. You, you say, what, what power is it? The power is not in you. The power is in the words that you speak. It's in the gospel. Yep. The power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have the greatest message in the world. I'm not trying to be a smart like We have a message that all the cults and the false religions don't have. They have a message of works. They have a message of man's, you know, what man can do, what man needs to do to get attain heaven, all this and that. No, we have salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It was to be a majestic evening on Friday, October the 18th, 1991. Talk about distractions that distract us from witnessing like we ought to and passing out tracts. Just handing people a gospel tract. It was to be a majestic evening on Friday, October 18, 1991. The world-class Chicago Symphony presented the final concert in its year-long celebration of the symphony's 100th year centennial celebration. For the first time in United States symphony history, the present conductor and two former conductors of an orchestra stood on the same stage. If I can pronounce their names. Raphael Kubelek, George Soltai, and Daniel Berenbaum 
At a centenary celebration dinner before the concert, patrons had received souvenir clocks as gifts. <coughs> souvenir clocks as gifts. As Daniel Barenboim sat down at the piano and Greg Soldi lifted his baton to begin Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto, a great sense of drama filled Chicago's historic orchestra hall. The beauty of the music took over the event. A few minutes later at 9.15 p.m., the, the music began to unravel. Out of the auditorium, a little beep sounded. Then another and another. Little beeps were sounding everywhere. <coughs> Barenboim and the symphony plowed ahead, but everybody was distracted. And the music suffered. Finally, after the first movement ended, Henry Fogel, F-O-G-E-L, the executive director of the symphony, true story, walked on stage to explain what had happened. This great, wonderful event. The manufacturer of the souvenir clocks presented at the pre-concert dinner had set the alarms to go off at 9.15. <laughs> now there was only one way to get on the concert. Fogel asked everyone who had one of the clocks to check them in with an usher. So what do you say? As I close, I'm saying this. Distractions and trivial things have terrible power to disrupt or even make a farce of what is truly important. May we as Christians not become distracted from serving Christ by trivial things that don't amount to a hell of beef. Amen? Yeah. I've watched it through the years, got saved in 1977. And I've watched the devil take people and just distract them from salvation, distract them, uh, save people from serving the Lord. I mean, just get involved in all kinds of stupid things. Or get involved in some things that aren't stupid or dumb or ignorant or trivial, but they don't put Christ first. There's a lot of things there's not nothing really wrong with them, but just don't put them ahead of Jesus Christ Amen. and being obedient and faithful to Him. So you've got to have your priorities right. You put Jesus first, others, and then you, J O Y, joy. You'll have joy. Jesus, J, others, O, Y, U. But most people have that completely reversed. Yeah. Matter of fact, Jesus isn't even on the list of a lot of people's lives. But we ought to have him first in our lives. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. ought to have him first. Let's stand if you would.